Again, I hope that you have not received the likely to confusion office action, but if you have, these are the options here for overcoming them or essentially what to do next. Welcome to another episode of Tip Top Startups, the podcast where we teach entrepreneurs about legal and business affairs strategy. I am your host, David Nima. I'm one of the top trademark and technology attorneys in the country. I'm also author of the books, Tip Top Startups and Tip Top Trademarks. They are required reading for any first-time entrepreneur that's looking to launch a product and raise money and navigate the legal and business affairs behind innovation. In today's podcast, we are going to discuss... That navigating the trademark maze of overcoming likelihood of confusion as an office action, okay? So let's talk a little bit about it. Now, as you may know, the trademark process is a lengthy process. I discuss it all in chapter, uh, in, in the book, Tip Top Trademarks. I discuss the entire trademark process. And one of the main issues or topics of trademark law is what's called likelihood of confusion, Likelihood of confusion is it probably something that most non-lawyers are actually familiar with because it basically means trademark infringement. It means that your trademark is what's considered too similar to another trademark and therefore it is likely to cause confusion in the marketplace, right? So your trademark has to be relatively unique in your industry for it to survive a likelihood of confusion um, analysis. And uh, we discuss likelihood of confusion in chapter three of Tip Top Trademarks, and I give you my best tips on how to clear your trademark for likelihood of confusion. And essentially what it comes down to, likelihood of confusion, is that, like I said, there is high degree of similarity between the trademark and there's high degree of similarity between the industries in which the two trademarks are competing. Say, for example, that my trademark is the word Pepsi, right? It's a long existing trademark in the United States, and it's protected in connection with carbonated beverages, right? Soft drinks. Now, if somebody else comes and files another trademark, and let's say they call it, Shep, let's say they call it Mepsi, right? Instead of Pepsi, they're calling it Mepsi, M-E-P-S-I. Now that's going to be what's called likely to confusion because the word Mepsi is too similar to the word Pepsi and therefore it is likely to cause confusion in the, in the marketplace and that trademark will not be allowed to proceed and will receive a likelihood of confusion refusal. Okay, so that's one example of how you might you know, subject yourself to a likelihood of confusion refusal by adopting a trademark that sounds similar to another trademark that's already existing in the marketplace. But let's talk about what you can do when you receive a likelihood of confusion refusal, okay? Now, the way I consult my clients when a likelihood of refusion refusal is facing my client's trademark application is that they essentially have four options here. Number one, you can file arguments against the likelihood of confusion determination. This is called an appeal. You essentially file what's called a response to an office action, and you file arguments, just like you would file a brief in court, for example, with several pages of arguments, arguing why the two trademarks are not likely to cause confusion. So your first option of overcoming a likelihood of confusion refusal is filing arguments against the determination of likelihood of confusion. Your second option for after you receive the likelihood of confusion ref refusal is to seek the consent or to seek and get the permission of the owner of the cited mark. So let's say, for example, if my trademark is facing a likelihood of confusion because of the trademark Pepsi, I will be able to look up the attorney or the owner information for that trademark and actually, I can actually contact the representative for that trademark and seek their consent, seek their permission, ask them if they will allow my trademark to go forward. If they say yes, then you can actually use their consent and file a response in the trademark office and get your trademark approved to the next phase. The trademark office will accept 
the written consent from the owner of the cited trademark in a likelihood of confusion office action. So you can actually get their consent. Now, of course, there's a little bit of strategy that goes behind this, and you may want to work with an attorney for all of these. But nevertheless, there is an option to what, do what's called seeking consent and re receiving consent from the owner of the cited trademark in the likelihood of confusion office action. The third option to at when you receive a likelihood of confusion refusal is to attack the trademark that has been cited as the basis for the refusal. This is called the cited mark, right? So let's say again in my Pepsi example, I uh, you know I receive a likelihood of confusion refusal, and they're saying that the word Pepsi, the trademark Pepsi, is standing in your way. And you're not able to trademark, get your trademark because it is likely to cause confusion with this existing trademark called Pepsi. So how do you overcome that? You, it, you can attack the Pepsi trademark. If you have arguments that are valid for what's called invalidity, right, to invalidate that trademark, you can file a petition to cancel and attack the existing trademark. Again, no easy feat, and you should definitely consult with an attorney before taking some of these actions. Nevertheless, there is an option here to f attack the existing trademark. You don't have to get their consent if they're not giving it to you, maybe they're not available. If there's legal grounds to cancel the trademark, you want to explore those options and consider it. It could be a very viable option for you to overcome the likelihood of confusion refusal. And the fourth and final option when you receive a likelihood of confusion refusal is to do nothing. You can always do nothing. And if you do nothing, there'll be certain consequences. Of course, your trademark application will abandon. You might face additional legal liability if you're using the trademark in the marketplace and it is likely to cause confusion. So doing nothing is maybe not a great choice, but nevertheless, it is an option. So once again, your four options are file arguments against the likelihood of confusion, seek the consent of the owner of the cited trademark, file a cancellation proceeding and otherwise attack the existing cited trademark or do nothing and let your application abandon and potentially consider a rebranding. So these are some of the these are some of the options here when you receive a likelihood of confusion refusal. Again, the best way to approach this part of the trademark process is to avoid a like a, a trademark that is likely to cause confusion. And the best way to do that is to do what's called a trademark clearance search, a trademark search and clearance. Now, no search is 100% guaranteed, but nevertheless, it is going to be giving you a lot more information to work with in terms of whether your trademark may cause a likelihood of confusion in the marketplace rather than filing blind without doing any searching at all. Now, again, I discuss the way I do my searches for my clients and what I think entrepreneurs can do to do some of their own searches in chapter three of likelihood of, of, of tip top trademarks, which is titled likelihood of confusion, conflict checked analysis. So check that out. And again, I hope that you have not received the likelihood of confusion office action, but if you have, these are the options here for overcoming them or essentially what to do next. This is David Nima, author of tip top trademarks and tip top startups. And I will see you guys on the next video.